Adrian always complains that he never gets good shots of us, so... Well, we're staging some shots deliberately, we are, thank you. And, and uh, we can come and sit down, can't we? And we should find as if by magic that these <coughs> microphones work, which is really, really good. That's great. Are you okay, Shirley? Can, can you see us all right there? Because we're, con we're conscious that... Uh, you can see me any time. grown three foot, William, since I last saw you, I think that's what it is. You see, that's what it is. Never mind. Okay, gosh, all these cameras. Okay, let, 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 let's do the basic things. Mm -hmm. How do you get into writing, then? Um, I started writing other than when ordered to do so by teachers when I was at school and we had a school magazine as schools tended to do and I and I wrote one or two pieces frankly to impress my English teacher that I was prepared to do this extra work and I had I was this terrible creature a 14 15 year old adolescent boy who thought he was funny and some, someone I went to school with actually sent me copies of these old school magazines not long ago and with these pieces in them and they are awful. <laughs> they are so embarrassingly awful. And, um, I think that's quite true. I, I'm a teacher by trade in case, in case you wonder. Well, you know about... They were, were where I come from, so I'm well used to marking, to marking essays. And, um, uh, but I think there were, there, were, there were kind of one or two key moments. I, in 1951, uh, there was a thing called the Festival of Britain and for our English homework we were given the task of writing something about the Festival of Britain and I wrote this and I tried very hard and it was all about a, a small community celebrating the festival and, uh, and when the uh, teacher came to hand the, the books back the following week he didn't hand mine back I thought oh god I, I've gone over the top with the jokes but no, he read mine out to the class and said, this is how it should be done, boys. That's nice. And girls. That's nice. And that was quite a formative, formative experience. And he hinted that I might make a living. I mean, he murmured the word journalism at that point. It's quite a, a brave thing to say. Went off to university, um, Bachelor of Architecture, brackets, failed, Newcastle. <laughs> yes. uh, in fact, oh, God. I, uh, I did four years of a five-year course, uh, and then about two years ago, they gave me an honorary degree. <laughs> <laughs> and at the, the little ceremony, I said, I make it a gap of, I think, 51 years between enrolment and graduation. And was this a record? A question they have not yet answered, actually. Well, because uh, in the new modular system, you could probably do it any way you like, really, nowadays. Yeah, I dare say, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and okay, so, so it was a great, to, the great thing about oh. university is it's a chance to practice things, to practice living, really, and live out your fantasies, because universities are full of kids living out, out their fantasies of being, you know, politicians, ja jazz musicians, writers, actors, stand-up comedians. These days they'd, they'd want to be stand-up comedians. Mm. And, it, and I was living out my fantasy of being a writer, and wrote lots of student journalism. I used to go into the, the editorial office of our student newspaper once a week and say, are there any reader's letters? If the answer was no, we would write the reader's letters <laughs> and uh, under very silly names. And, and it was just a great place to practice. And then I wrote, do you want other things? I'm just, just interested to know, I mean, I mean, but, 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 I mean but as you said, I suppose, in, in those days, I mean, the, the media was, was it, I suppose, in its infancy, in that sense of the word. Yeah, uh, there really I mean, wasn't any. I mean, was there some opposition, possibly from your parents, the thought of you going into journalism and, and writing plays? Were they rather you were stuck at being an architect? And my parents were deeply disappointed when I failed my, di when I didn't get to take the mm. finals, when mm. I got thrown out. And I tried to reassure them that this was all for the best in the long term. And um, I, mean, I was deeply relieved when that they lived long enough, I mean, they were well into the early days of what I have to call my career. And I even persuaded, my, my dad used to say, used to preface everything with the words, well, of course, I don't like plays. Because <laughs> he associated, associated plays of being dragged off to the theatre by my mum mm. to see some Terence Rattigan thing done by the weekly rep. Plays, with, and I could understand why it had nothing to do with him and his life. And in a way, that was my dad talking, all that yes, stuff about... Yes, yeah, sure. Well, he'd worked in the shipyards originally. 
And I thought, this is silly, because my dad is a bright, intelligent man who's lived a, a long and dignified life. What's wrong with plays that he doesn't like them? So it became part of my quest was to write the kind of plays that my dad would like and that my mum would like. I mean, my mum would, my mum would like it anyway, yeah, even if yeah, you hated yeah, it. Yeah, mums always do. That's what mums, mums do. do. <laughs> and when I did Close the Coal House Door in 1968, uh, he saw that, he saw that two or three times, and he said, it's the best play I've ever seen, son. And, good, I told, and I did have a, one sort of very poignant conversation with him after my mum died. Uh, she died first, and I said to my dad, God, you must have had terrible doubts, you know, when I... Because actually, I had a, I'd got a job in an architect's office in Hull, and I was all scuffed, I was getting £10 a week or something, yeah. and, and it was fairly respectable. And I said to him, you must have had terrible doubts when I quit the job and announced to the world I was going to write plays for a living. Mm. He said, I never had any doubts. <laughs> and he might have been lying, or he might not have been lying, but I thought it was a terrific thing to say. Yeah. Well, it's that support that makes all the difference sometimes. Absolutely. It? They it's never really wavered by one you. inch. They were wonderful. And, um, I, uh, and I, I guess you probably, I mean, did you find yourself... I mean that 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 period. Where, I mean, it, where you go into, the, I mean, from the forties to the fifties, was a period of great change in plays, as you say. I yeah. mean, these had always been classical theatre plays, so the, the Ratigans, and suddenly you had Howard Pinter and Alan Owen and and, and yourself coming along. I mean, mm. it, did you find there was some pressure there from the establishment that they didn't like the kind of plays you were writing? No, I think I think what a bit. Um, I mean, it's, it's conventional to regard the 60s as the change point, but I think the 50s were actually more interesting because mm. the 50s was when society got pregnant with the 60s, if you see what I mean. <laughs> the, the, the thing began... To, I mean, look back in anger, it was 1956. Yeah, yeah. And, and one sensed that things were going on. There was a, And you, you couldn't articulate it because you're in the midst of it. You, you're just living your life on a daily basis. And... and uh, not thinking, of, you can't stand outside what's happening. Sure. But in retrospect, I think there was uh, there was a lot of thing, a lot of stuff going on. And then, because what I, I mean, the the way I wrote one, I wrote a television play for a competition in about 1959, where it didn't win, but I got a taste for for writing drama, mm. and essentially wrote six lousy plays nobody wanted before the first tele, before the first radio play crept on in '61, I think it was. <clears throat> yeah. And that, that's the apprenticeship, that was my apprenticeship. Also, reading every television play that was in print, and I think there were th about four volumes. There were, I think, two volumes of Granada plays and a volume of BBC plays and a collection of Paddy Shievsky's plays, The Great American. And I read, I used to get these things from the library and all, yeah. more or less permanently. I'd take them back and I'd get them out again. And I. The ones I liked best, I almost knew by heart. And I guess you found it quite. I mean, I guess it, it made sense for you to, to pitch your ideas at BBC North to begin with. I mean, <laughs> was that where you first um, like a smashing day? Is that where you first took them, or had they been been to other companies before? That? No. Well, the route was I, I I I had a radio play done by a wonderful man called Alfred Bradley, who was a sound radio drama producer working for the BBC in Leeds. And he kind of passed me on to Vivian Daniels, who, <coughs> who did the same job for the BBC in Manchester. Um, at which, at that time, Vivian produced eight plays a year for the network from Manchester without reference to London, working out of an old church hall in Dickinson Road in Manchester, which had been the headquarters of a, a company called Mancunian Films, where they made the George Formby films and the Sandy Powell's films, the old Mother Riley films, Frank Randall's, and all these great northern performers. And they used to make these movies in about 10 days for <laughs> £2.17 and sixpence. And they were rarely shown outside of the north, and they made a fortune. Yeah. So I was, it was lovely to be working in the footsteps of people like George Formby and Frank Randall and Arthur Lucan. Brilliant. Uh, and that's... Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Alfred passed me on to Vivian and I, and I showed him a couple of things I'd written and he didn't quite like them. I mean, uh, the first television play I wrote for Vivian or that I showed to him 
It was when I was a discontented architect. <laughs> and it was a play about a discontented architect. And it was called It Feels Like Monday. So it was quite a nice title. And I, was, I, mean, I still remember what Vivian said about it. He said, I, he said, I, I like the first, the first 15 minutes. After that, he said, the jauntiness becomes resistible, <laughs> which is a great phrase. And I think what it meant was, I was so eager to prove what a good writer I was. Every line had to be funny. Yeah. Or with some yeah. abstruse reference to prove how smart and cute and clever I was. And that, and you said you gotta to learn to bury all that. Mm. You know. But mm. I was you know, I was a I was a bloody baby. I knew nothing. <laughs> what I now know because some of the people that I've worked for at that time, um Subsequent people like David Rose, who I think has David been here? No, no, he um, hasn't. No. Um, who was my first producer on Z Cars and then ran Pebble Mill for many years. I mean, one, the, probably arguably the t best producer, the most important yeah. producer in the history of the industry. Uh, and we've become, we still are great friends. Uh, confess to me that. They, you know, the, his generation of producers, which is, I mean, they're only slightly older than I was. Yes, yeah. Says we didn't really know all that very much. No. Any, none of us, they, none of them knew anything. That's exactly they what were, they say when they come here. Actually, yeah. <laughs> they were making it up as they went along. It. It let's, let's have a look at Smashing Day. This is. Oh, yeah. I know your, your angle's not very good for seeing a bit of it here, but you I always, remember it. You can always take it home and watch it afterwards. But, but let's have a look, look at a bit of Smashing Day to give the audience a flavour of what a 1962. Yeah. And this was this was Vivian like. Daniels. Yes, it was indeed Vivian Daniels. Mm. Well, as for getting married, well, that's a bit different, isn't it? Oh, it was a bit like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, she invited you back to see it? Yeah, a few times. Sundays mostly. And there's an old man been asking you if you've got a good job. No, not really. Well, he did say, though, that four in a year was too many. Four? Oh, yeah, well, it was funny, that. Eh? No, I liked it at first, I really did. Ah, but when you stand the date on one library book, you stand it on the lot, don't you? And then they've got this machine... You have jobs like most people have headaches. Well, you've got to look around before you settle down. Look at that soft brother-in-law of mine. What's the deal? You're always doing you're not about for that. I've been a foster for about 150 years, this Fred. Came from saying at the time office, that's him. Yeah, and to hear him talk, you think the fossils was the government, the United Nations and Wells Fargo all rolled into one. Yeah. Right, terrible. I mean, it's no good. They grind you to dust, and then they give you a gold watch to make you think it's been for your benefit. Oh, well, you've got to work somewhere, haven't you? Well, yeah, that's the trouble. Uh, Reminds me a bit of sort of serious likely lads. <laughs> well, uh, interesting. When I remember when the likely lads first turned up, and and, and, and I realised I read about or saw the, the first episode. I thought, what an obvious idea. And, I mean, it, was, it seemed so obvious to me I wouldn't have yeah. bothered doing it. <laughs> so that's how much I know. <laughs> well, what was interesting, if you see the whole of, of Smashing Day, uh, Alfie Lynch and John Thor, and the young actors, I think it was, it's uh, Angela Douglas and June Barry, know how to work to a camera. Hmm. The, the older characters and parents, and there's a, I think there's a grand, grandfather, generally speaking sort of rounded up from northern repertory companies and were still acting to the back of the gallery yeah. uh even though the camera's there but they they've learned about it how to do it i mean they i think alfie and, and john were terrific in this and you get that it's the same spirit as billy Lyre and saturday night and sunday morning and it is it is know, it's, it's that whole sort of young person's yeah field, isn't it, really? work yeah. work is the thing that's going to destroy you and you have to be either you buy into it or, or you escape from it mm. or try to rebel against it and the notion of work as this awful thing and it's this thing about true. working at fosters <laughs> because it's it's a very sad play actually smashing day because he ends up marrying the wrong girl and working at fosters for the rest you, of his I mean, life I mean, I mean uh, without sort of wishing to leap around your career too much but i mean I guess the one thing that, that I noticed over the years about your work is that, I mean, I've had those sort of three or four different ways you can split it up, and I'll try and talk about it in, in those sort of compartmentalised ways. You've got your, your, your own work, your plays, mm -hmm. your seals that you write yourself, you've got your adaptations work, mm -hmm. you've done on things like Sherlock Holmes, then you've got probably the, the more sort of, sort of 
it's comedic work, perhaps you'd like the Selwyn Froggins mm -hmm. or whatever the sitcom type work. But the work that you do yourself does have that sort of anti-establishment feel to it. Yeah. I think in in many many ways, and it comes to right from the earliest work yeah. to the recent work. I think doesn't it? I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, no, I know so. <laughs> and this what we were, I mean that was our generation was anti-establishment, and and in a way we're even. I'm a bit anti-establishment. I'm anti the establishment within our establishment, even. Mm. Uh, meaning, um, I'm picking my words very carefully here. I'm anti the, the kind of Oxbridge establishment that still runs our business or runs large areas of the business. And I was quite shocked, you see, when, when I, back in the, again, in the 60s, a wonderful producer director called Don Taylor, who worked with David Mercer, had this idea of doing a series set in a new university. Remember, we, we all got very excited about the Robbins Report and all these new universities. And, and we, a bunch of writers, were, we were sent to places like York and UEA in Norwich and Sussex to, to talk to the students. And they, the students got free drinks for an evening while they talked <laughs> us about their problems and stories and so on. And out of this, a series was going to be made. I was sitting with a room full of writers and the producer and script editor in a bar in Norwich. And I looked around and I started, and I realized I was the only one who hadn't been to Oxford. Mm. And I thought, hang on a minute. These people have decided it's a good idea to write about new universities and the, 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 the children of the working class coming through and transforming society. And they've grabbed it already. And so I'm still, I've still got that <laughs> hang up. It's still a I, think, I think what's interesting about some of the early work like, like that is that it's almost like your, your characters were not as a century because some of your later characters. So mm -hmm. they, were, they were really establishment people when you were trying to make them more anti-establishment because there was more, maybe perhaps more conflict where I think your work over the years has mellow now they become more anti-establishment through humour perhaps yeah and, yeah. and through almost yeah. stepping aside from the system as opposed to trying to punch it on on the nose i think what what you're probably saying overly politely <laughs> is that in the early years i was very preachy because <laughs> i knew what was wrong with the world and how to fix it all we needed was a a, a, a not entirely non-violent revolution and and that would sort it in that line in, in Trinity Tales about, um, about the, uh, the cocktail that he makes for, for, the, for the boss man. <laughs> that will yeah, redistribute your wealth for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which I have to say, if you, if you use that line today, any producer stroke, stroke script edit under the age of 40 would say, I don't understand what this means. Yeah. Yeah. And which is kind of sad. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's interesting when you said that about that preaching. I, I didn't quite see it in that way. I wonder whether it's because I feel like the people of the time wouldn't wouldn't allow you to take that route of using more humour and, and music and things. Whereas now, I mean, did, 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 have you found in the last say ten years or maybe twenty years that as your career's gone on, you've had more flexibility from script editors to write it the way you want to write no, it? No, less. Really? Quite definitely less. Um, and I don't think I think it's 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 to do with oh god, dreadful word, the zeitgeist. Um, I mean, the, the the serious point. I suppose I was making about Vivian and Manchester was that he could make eight plays a year from Manchester and nobody mm. would, would mm. stop him or worry him about them. When David Rose was at Birmingham, he would be given a, sort of an annual list. You know, we want f four plays for today and six 30 minute theatres and a couple of series, given a shopping list. Yeah. And unless there was anything particularly contentious, the first thing that BBC controllers would know about any of these things is when they were shown. I, when, we're we're going to look at the first part of a trilogy yeah, later yeah, on. Yeah. When that went out, I was in the BBC canteen the day after one of the episodes was shown, having me lunch, talking to somebody, and it, across the table walks David Attenborough, who was then controller BBC too, said, saw your play last night, loved it. Thank you, off he went. And the first thing he knew about the play was when he'd sat down and watched it on his own channel. These days, everything is, re I mean, everything is re referred up to controller level. Yeah. And it's this, this, this centralised culture that we're living in <coughs> is, is actually very scary. 
think that's quite true. They, they all bleat on it in Whitehall, and, uh, 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 and uh, I mean, it, it cross, all our national institutes, they bleat on about devolution and devolve power, devolve responsibility, but they don't do it. No, of course They not. don't do it. Of course not. And until they do, we're going to stay in, I think, the rather dismal period we're in now mm. with, with television drama. So, so today you are, you're writing plays of your own, which, which, which is great. So how do you come to write serials like Z Cars, then, mm. where you're taking <coughs> somebody else's premise, presumably, and they're giving you characters to work with that aren't yours? And do you find that a great conflict, the fact you can't no. put the words in the mouth, perhaps? You use a different set of muscles. I mean, the, the Z Cars thing happened in 63. I mean, I've progressed in 44 years from writing cop shows to writing cop shows. <laughs> so there's a career trajectory for you. Um, now, I got a phone call from my then agent, Peggy Ramsey. Um, Darling, they'd like you to write for Z Cars. The reason the invitation came is kind of a man, this is incredible, a man from the BBC Contracts Department had seen a play of mine at the Victoria Theatre, Stoke on Trent. Now, the notion these days of anyone from BBC Contracts going to any theatre <laughs> is a bit of a, oh, almost under, but, uh, but yes, it, that's, and he, and he said, this, this is a lad, you want this lad on, your, on the books, or well, mm -hmm. words to that effect. And I met John Hopkins, who was then the script editor, and also the best writer in British television at the time. And we got on fine, and I said, and I, I knew a little bit, I said, is there a Bible? I knew there were these things called Bibles yeah. that series was supposed to have. He said, not really. He said, there, there were some notes that somebody did when they went to Kirby. Uh, if we can find a copy, we'll let you have them. <laughs> but, uh, and I think I did get these notes. Uh, I said, well, what happens next? When, when you get an idea, right, write it down. No, don't make it too long. You know, one sheet of paper's enough. And I did. And that's all I ever did with any of the Z cars. It was a single sheet of paper saying this is what I think the story is about and this is who will be in it. I mean, what was most important for them was who would be in it because they had to juggle the coppers yeah. Uh, yeah. so that they weren't in consecutive weeks to, and so it was Z Victor 1 or Z Victor 2 and, and so on. And I did and I, I did this single sheet and they said that's fine, we'll commission it. Uh, but at that time to be invited to write for Z Cars was like a papal blessing because this yes. was the top show. There'd never been a, a programme like it in terms of its effect on on the audience, on on everything, really. And I, actually, on, on, on cop shows to this day, because we, we do know um, that when Stephen Bochco was, was preparing Hill Street Blues, he and the team ordered copies of Zedcar's episodes from the BBC and sat and watched them, and they actually studied Z cars. I mean, they probably studied a lot of other things as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, my best guess is they studied Ed McBain and the 87 Precinct books, but I have no evidence to support. But we do have evidence that they watched Z cars because Daniel Trevanti told Frank Windsor as much <laughs> when they met on an afternoon television program. So that must give you a whole. So it's a free view box watching the telly. They are getting the no. right oh. an unscripted uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> extra bit from somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It'll be in your next play, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> safe. <laughs> I'm quite worried myself now. No, don't it's worry. You, would let, you will to never to know. know. Nobody ever that's knows. That's probably quite true, actually. That's Nobody ever true. knows, including me. So, uh, I mean, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, uh, you said earlier to me that sometimes you know you draw characters from real life or whatever people mm -hmm. or aspects of people is that something you do w with things like the Z cars as well you, you would use that oh, influence you might see situations or things and you think yeah, silly, silly things yeah uh, I remember I, I think it was probably a I don't know if it was a Z cars or a softly softly it was a Z cars called a question of storage and this happened because we were this coincided with when we were trying to open a new uh, a, a theatre in Hull, I mean, what is now the Hull Truck Theatre, and but for, we spent about five years on you know raising money and raising the consciousness of the community sure. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And one of one of on our committee, we'd recruited the, uh, a guy who was uh, chair. I think he was chair of the, or he was certainly on the board of a local firm, local shop called Hammond's, big uh, yes. department store, biggest in the city. And an old family, you know, old business family, 
and Chris, I used to, I used to say, tell me what it's like running a, uh, you mustn't call it a shop if it's a store, <laughs> you see. Oh, running and he used to tell, what he told me, what he let slip one day, that they budgeted 2% of turnover to cope with internal pilfering. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I thought, I wonder how they do it. So I wrote, a, I wrote an episode which was about internal pilfering from a big department store and but this guy <laughs> works in the in the tailoring department in the clothes department and when they actually go to the house every cupboard they open <laughs> hundreds of jackets fall out <laughs> and they say well it, this is you. it's my fault it, was, it all became a question of storage I mean it was it was kind of silly really and uh, Elwyn Jones who was then the head of series said this is l absolutely impossible Alan the situation couldn't happen and about a year later or six months later the story broke in Hull and, and they <clears throat> they nicked about half a dozen people who'd been stealing stuff from from the store and a big front page story so I copied this to Elwyn mm. Jones and there now and it's lovely when you you win uh, and little, and petty I, little I battles I, I, I guess sometimes it's the BBC took the view that they, they would show it. I mean, like when ITV would sometimes take the view that they would make things, and then if it was too close to real life, they wouldn't show them. I know no hiding place lost an episode because it, it was too similar to real life. Really? Uh, so it was pulled. I, I think, yeah, I mean, and I think... I, I mean, I, that's why I get very nervous about this phrase, docudrama, because it, I think it's a contradiction in terms. I mean, I, I think you've got to decide, are you making a documentary, are you making a drama? If it's a drama... It's supposed to be far-fetched. That's the point of drama. And so if you want to, you don't go to see Hamlet if you're thinking of having a holiday in Denmark. <laughs> yeah. You, um, it's, it's a really different fun, thing. That, 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 and I think it gets very fuzzy. And I get very, uh, I have a great admiration for Peter Morgan and so on, but I, I do get very twitchy about things like a mm. um, you know, very social secretary. Uh, saying, well, here's this funny man called David Blunkett, let's all laugh at him. And, well, so why? So what? Mm. Who cares? And who but, will care in three years' time? But I guess that's very much down to the cult of the celebrity. I mean, I mean, mm. I mean, I, I, I mean, one thing that I've picked up over the years is that I get the impression as a writer you've been quite involved with your productions mm -hmm. in terms of being on the set sometimes and having that ability to, to as, you, as you talked earlier with Lewis about, you know, to change things, whereas... Some writers we've had here at that event said, you know, I write the script, I send it away, I, I, I don't get involved in casting, mm -hmm. I don't get involved in production at all, you know. And, yeah. and perhaps nowadays you're finding it harder to have that involvement, perhaps, perhaps they're telling you more who they want to have in the show. Mm -hmm. you know? um, the, yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's a fairly amicable thing. I mean, the, the, the Lewis episode that starts shooting today, uh, the director came round to the house. We tried to have all the production meetings at our house so we can smoke yeah. <laughs> and most people who are working for the broadcasters are, are, are delighted to get away from their buildings Yeah, because most of them seem to be working places that are like the Lubyanka and it's a great relief to go into a proper house with the best coffee in London obviously <laughs> and several ashtrays so um, no, and so the director Dan who's directing it mm. came round we had a nice chat uh, I emailed him a few casting suggestions and and he took them very seriously mm. and we've actually I mean I, mm. I know that the, the, you know, the two principal guests as it were are Neil Pearson and Hayden Gwynn and who are pretty well That's spot very on. interesting because it, yeah, I mean uh, perhaps, perhaps you just perhaps it's, it's a mistaken view on my part but you do seem to have more autonomy in the industry than some of the the people we, we've had here who've come along and said you know we get told who we're having we get told mm -hmm. what we're doing and that, that's good isn't it Is that yeah I think it might be just be because they're, I'm old and they want to humour me <laughs> I don't know I oh I, I, I don't know I've always taken it for granted that that I should have a bit of a say uh, and it just seems a sensible thing that I I mean, and there are writers who I know and are actually not very interested in all of that. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. I was unusual like, even on the Z cars and the, certainly on the Softly team. Uh, I remember, I think it was Alan Pryor um, said to me, "You do seem to get, you seem to like actors." 
<laughs> well, yes, some of my best friends are. Mm, he wasn't at all sure about this thing of actually liking Axis. <laughs> but, 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 but I guess I guess that that, that, that that comes to the work as well, though, because I mean, in, in not in every case, obviously, but you can see, you know, there's Bill Maynard in Trinity Tales. He's also in So and Froggy. Yeah. Or you've got James Bolam doing the Bider Becker yeah. Seals, and then yeah. coming back doing the afternoon play for yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 do you consider yourself to have a, a repertory company? Yes, that I do. You like? I mean, it's, it's become as a standard joke. Every, every woman, every female part of her is actually for Barbara Flynn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> even if the character is 21 years old. <laughs> 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 and every male part is, is, is Jimmy. Mm. I mean, and I have to say, when, when we watched the Biderbecks again not long ago, um, I think it was at the time of the, the DVD issue or reissue. Yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, without getting overly personal, it was uh, Shirley and I uh, ran away together in 1984. And uh, and look at the Bidebecks now, it, they are, it kind of, they're, they're, they're pals with the two of them move in together. Yeah. Uh, they are much more biographical than I ever <laughs> was prepared to admit at the time, or even, I'm not even prepared to admit it now. <laughs> But there well, are. Let's edit that bit out of the tape afterwards. Uh, I don't care. Yeah. 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 Here's a point link. where it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing matters. <laughs> Say what the hell do you like. But, so, yes, there are, there are things in there which are. Uh, and that's as much as I'm prepared to say on the yeah. subject. It was interesting because I, I had picked that up because you, you'd talked about the fact, you know, you'd always wanted to work with Barbara Flynn yeah. after the Biderbecker seal, so, you know. Well, yeah, but the Barbara thing began. Uh, she did a, a, a little part in Barchester Chronicles. Uh, and we, so Shirley and I went on location somewhere in somewhere very pretty, and it was in mid summer. It was very hot summer day, and she and it was uh, Janet Moore, wasn't it, wearing these very big heavy clothes and the baby, baby bold, you know, in this pram, and Barbara was entertaining this baby by doing Donald Duck impersonations. <laughs> And I thought, oh yeah, this is the woman for me. <laughs> uh, and and now we just all became great mates at that point, and Jim as well. I mean, it's just family, really. And, That's very um, true. That's very true. So, something about David Rose, and I don't want to take you back quite to the 60s, but mm -hmm. that, that, as you said earlier, that was a very interesting meeting because you, you did go on to work a lot for David Rose, mm -hmm. didn't you, in your career? David was wonderful to me because after. <clears throat> After we did, I mean, he produced Zed, he was the original producer of Zed Cars, I did 18 of those. He then called me up one day and said, um, would you like to write a series for Thora Heard? And at that time, Thora was best known for the, doing that show with Freddie Frinton. Say, hold that thought. Mark? Yes? Do you have that clip of the First Lady? Oh, yeah. They are. Hey, yeah. ha have a little look. There's not much left of the First Lady, but we found a little clip of it. Yeah, God. To run you. Then you can tell us about the First Lady, because that was one of the first series. Get out! Charming, I must say. Now clear off. Who do you think you are? You're no copper. No, but I can fetch one if you want. So there's not an awful lot left the First Lady, unfortunately. And nothing of thought were heard in that clip, but tell me about the First Lady then, yeah, because you were discussing Well, that. I got this phone call and I thought, well, that's a bit odd, you know. Um, and I thought of Thor as, you know, a comical... Uh, you know, I think she, you know, she should be the comical woman serving tea, in in the station buffy kind of character. Uh, I knew she did summer seasons in Blackpool, generally in in comedies by Walter Greenwood, and and I thought I thought it was a bit silly at first, and I thought about it. I thought well, if you can be that funny that consistently, and all the great all the great comics had proved themselves as actors. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, Max Wall, Jimmy Jill, yeah. all, all did that. Les Dawson, who we'll see later. And Les, later. of course. Yeah. Uh, so I thought I'll give it a go. And because I wanted to write her as a Labour councillor. Uh, and so I can't do that because that would be proclaiming allegiance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I said, well, I can't write her as a Tory. So eventually it was agreed I would write her as an independent councillor. 
So it's way ahead of her time, and we do actually have them now. Yeah. I mean, proper independent yeah. councillors. Uh, so the notion was that it would be a a, a series about a community with her as an independent, free-thinking councillor, flanked by the Labour man, played by Bob Keegan, and the Tory, played by Jimmy Grout, who later became Inspector Morse's chief constable. Yeah. Uh, and um, I had a dog in the series called Heathcliff, which is <laughs> one of the few things I remember about it. Uh, and I wrote four episodes, and it, it almost worked. And we shot the whole thing in Barnsley, so the notion of the notion of an independent councillor in Barnsley was the notion of a Tory councillor in Barnsley was because <laughs> I think at the time it was like every I think everyone on the Barnsley council was Labour. It was yeah. thirty Labour men and <laughs> Labour men and well, mostly men, maybe two women and nobody else. That was the <laughs> uh, so we shot it, we shot it the filming we did the filming in Barnsley. So that was that, and it almost worked, but. Thor was ever so great because it was her first proper acting role on television. And we we saw her at a BAFTA ceremony, some nominee's lunch or something of the sort. And she said to me, I don't know where I'd be without my two Allens, <laughs> meaning me and Bennett, you see, because yeah. we were yeah. the only writers, we were the first writers to give her some proper mm. acting on television, proper characters. I mean, Star had a whole load of work for BBC Birmingham, but he didn't with David Rose. We did a lot, yeah. We did Middle Trinity Tales. Tales. Middle, Middleman, Trinity Tales. We did uh, a, a television version of the Fosdyke saga. And, I mean, virtually everything. Well, that there was I, a play called Land of Green Ginger. Or Land of Green Ginger, Ginger about yeah. Hull, which is... And perhaps you want to find that for us, Mark, perhaps Land of Green Ginger, just to change my order very slightly. Is what you to, I mean, I mean but was it someone you particularly enjoyed working in BBC Birmingham? I loved it, because, I mean, David gave me the run of the house, really. I mean, he, he said, there's the adventure playground. I mean, he didn't just say it to me, he said it to all kinds of people. Mm. And also, I mean, I, I was at Pebble Mill one day and he, and he said, oh, come down to the studio, there's, there's somebody in the gallery I'd like you to meet. I think you'd get on, it's his first play, go say hello and encourage him and tell him it's make the right sort of noises. And it was Alan Bleasdale doing Scully, Scully's Big Night, I think. Yeah, yeah, and probably things are early to bed as well. And, uh, and there was Bleasdale and, you know, we had a little chat and we started our long-standing mutual admiration society, which, uh, which endures to this day, I'm <laughs> very proud to say. And, uh, oh God, I could go and on I about mean, it. How easy was it to sell, I mean, to, to sell ideas? I mean, so BBC Birmingham had always had a reputation for being a little bit off the wall, a little bit cookie, yeah. perhaps, uh, not yeah, afraid absolutely. to do unusual ideas. Um, I think in David's period of office, it was almost unique in my experience. Uh, and he didn't, I mean, he, everything didn't go through on the nod. But I, I mean, I had a wonderful run there. Mm. And and as I say, I got, I, I was given the keys to the playground yeah. and say, go out and do whatever you like, Alan. Did, did we have this clip, Mark? This is a clip from Land of Green Ginger, but a play for today, I think you did, didn't yeah. you? Which was, yeah. which was good. You travelling to Hull? Yes. Going back home? Just for the weekend. How did you guess? Experience. Plus instinct. People from Hull, they all have this mysterious northern mist behind their eyes. You must be clever. Not really. It takes a clever fella to talk rubbish like that. No, what it is, it's envy. Fancy. I've lived in about a dozen places. You get to envy people who know where home is. Promised land. You see the odd biographical nature of it coming through again, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think it's fair to say, if, if, if Barbara Flynn isn't available, get Gwen Taylor. I mean, that was a <laughs> magical piece of acting. <clears throat> she got then fancy. I mean, she's not even from Hull. I mean, she's from Derbyshire, last, I think, originally. Uh, I think that Gwen's great quality is, I think she came late to acting. So she'd lived some proper life. Yeah. Which she brings, uh, as Brenda Blethyn does. There's something about late starters in acting. Um, Jim Broadbent, I think, is the same. That they they bring a you know, just a, a kind of different reality, isn't it? It's the same as in, t in teachers. Teachers who come down the graduate teacher program, 
who, who don't come straight from university have a different way of looking yeah, at teaching. Yeah, absolutely. They, they do. You know, and it's, I mean, one of the things I, I, in, in, in another part of the forest, I, I've done three big community plays with uh, people in Orkney for the St Magnus Festival. And working with the actors up there, they're all amateurs by definition, and they're all they walk on stage and they're they are they're all people shaped. Yep. They're not actor shaped. <laughs> and you get all shapes and sizes and tall and short and f beautiful and wrinkled and and, and it's one and it, they look different from a, a stage full of actors at the National or at the RSC. Mm. Because they, they, they haven't necessarily mm. taken care of themselves. Yeah, sure. Because it's not sure. part of their job. Sure. Yeah. Now, that, that, was a, yes. uh, that was... David was very keen to do things set in the region. Because his, his job title was Head of Drama, brackets, English Regions. So anything that had a real regional feel to it. So he did things like that. He did uh, the Peter Turson plays, uh, Peter's play about Whitby, the fishing party. Sure. And... Um, the one about the, the the three miners sailing down down the canal to Stratford. Yeah, three miners. Um, what's it called? It was called. <laughs> God. I should know what it's called. Fish, fish, Shakespeare, Shakespeare robust. robust. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. And last train through the Hare Castle Tunnel. Another yeah. Peter Turson. Yeah. Uh, the Tom Hadaway plays from the North East about the North Shields fish mm. key. But all that. Has where is that now? <laughs> well, I was just going to ask, ask you, uh, how did that contrast to when you did that afternoon play a couple of years ago? Well, it was exactly, the, the experience was identical, uh, in, in, in essence. I mean, the Will Trotter, who's head of drama at Pebble Mill, or what used to be Pebble Mill, um, said to me, we're, we're doing these afternoon plays, and I'd been aware of that, uh, but we want, we've, we're inviting one or two established writers to contribute to the series because they want to, quote, heighten the profile. And the deal is you have two cameras for eight days to make an hour-long drama. So in effect, you're doing it for about a third of the cost, the real cost of, of network, evening drama, yeah. peak hour drama. <clears throat> and I said, that's fine. So let's, if you've got eight, only got eight days, find a location, A, that is near, and B, that is brilliant, and C, that is cheap. So. A lot, and I'd, I'd been developing an idea with, with uh, for a series in the northeast, which had never happened, sadly, um, about allotments. I thought allotments. So, they, I mean, it's a, I think seven of the eight days we spent on the allotments, probably, yeah. and and I got deeply involved with with the director and said, let's let's ask Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. Jim was doing rep. He was doing Chichester. Uh, but he had two day, a two-day gap, which sat within our period, and he did his bits in two days. And he said, well, I'm just sitting on a box, man, so it's easy. <laughs> and, uh, and likewise, Paul Copley, let's get Paul. And most, I mean, they were all kind of first division yeah. actors. Yeah, they and, were. They and were. they leapt at it. I mean, Jim said, no, yes, I know. I'm sure I won't get him into trouble by quoting this. He, he phoned me, he said, e man, he said, it's lovely to read something where I don't want to hurl it across the room after five pages, uh, because it was good stuff. It know? was. It and, uh, <clears throat> but the question is not, the, the, the real question is why are they not doing 50 of these a year? And why are they not doing, you know, 10 from Birmingham, 10 from Manchester, 10 from Glasgow, 10 from, yeah. you know, uh, without reference to Alan Yentob or anybody at the BBC in London. You know, just give them the money, say, Make us ten plays. Let us see. Well, you're preaching to the converted here. There's no. no well, sure. The yeah. weird, the, 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 we're, we're from, from the single play play fold, really, as it were. Mm. Now, I mean, I mean, I, I guess in some time up to now, I've taught BBC up to now, really, mm -hmm. I have, and I come up to what roughly now, 1980 or something. But I guess that I, I guess your ITV work in that period was probably less well known. Uh, plays like Willow Cabins and A Question of Happiness that were shown in, in the bar and Villains and things like that were, were very, very good plays, but they mm -hmm. were, didn't get quite the same media exposure, say, no. things like your Z cars did. I mean, I mean so, so I, I'm just intrigued as to how you sort of, I suppose, not sort of swap sides, but why, why did the BBC Birmingham thing sort of tail to an end and suddenly you went and did Get Lost with Yorkshire and the Bide of um, Serials? Because they asked me. I mean, I mean, it did occur to me. Yorkshire Television was in business at least a, 10 years, I suppose, before I did any work for them. And it did used to cross my mind that I was living in Hull 
and that was Leeds, 50 miles, 60 yeah. miles away, yeah. and I never got any work from them. And I didn't ask them for any work, but, and then, and I can't remember which one, I, I don't know what was first, but it was probably, it might have been Willow Cabins. Yeah, that was your first in 75, I think, was oh, it, as, thank a play, you. as a play. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, it was wonderful. This is, again, it's, it's the way things happened then. The head of drama then was a man called Peter Wills, who um, had been an actor, uh, and he used to say, of course, of course, of course, I did go to, the, to Hollywood in the in the 30s, but my profile was about two years too late. <laughs> and very camp and a, a renegade really in his own quite he was the first man to put harold pinter on mm. british television yeah, he'd escaped from rediffusion <laughs> that's right but when he was at rediffusion and pinter couldn't get work anywhere else peter put his work on on an on mm. associated rediffusion it was itv were the first people a commercial television cha program channel was the first uh people to put pinter's work on television and keep him out of the poor house, yeah. um, which Pinter acknowledged at Peter's funeral. And, and the, I mean, the things like this get, they, these things get airbrushed out of history. Of course, of course. Anyway, Peter telephoned me, he said, he said this, this, isn't it time you wrote us a play? And I said, well, yes, all right then. Uh, what, what would you like me to do? I said, uh, should I do a treatment? Or an, oh, no, 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 no. So when you get an idea, telephone me, say, I've got an idea for a play. And uh, come over to Leeds. We'll have dinner together, and you can tell me about it. So fine, eventually got the idea. Rang him, went to Leeds, had dinner. I said, "What's well, about this chap and this woman and this about?" And stop! Don't tell me any more. Well, I've hardly told you anything. Yes, yeah. but little spoil it when I read the script, won't it? <laughs> and that was it. And on the basis of half a conversation, uh, commissioned the play, and um, what came out was Willow Cabins. And that's pretty well how it went on. And the the whole get lost by the Beck thing happened because because of J.B. Priest thing. They, they, Yorkshire wanted to do The Good Companions, and they wanted to do it in 13 episodes. And I read the book. I said, I don't need 13 episodes. It's too many. This is partly because I'd done A Star's Look Down for Granada in 13 episodes, and I... And it was, it was took so long, and I was knackered. You know, it's hard work <laughs> doing that many episodes. I said, let me do it in nine. Uh, oh, well, that'll leave us with four blank weeks. I said, I'll do a four-part original for the, those blank weeks. So that was the deal that I did Good Companions in nine episodes, and then yep. I did Get Lost to fill those four blank weeks. And it was but more or less as casual as that. We can probably have a quick look at Get Lost, possibly, Mark. She's the sort of... Cousin to Bite the Beck Cross, but well, it was a precursor. It was indeed. Prequel. Prequel, yeah. The yeah. early. Yeah. Oh, Amen. I like her. Damn. Who are you damning? The Christians? We should have asked to borrow a photograph of the vicar and the Smiths Phillips. For the files? That's what we know who we're looking for. Well, that solves one problem. We can ask to see photographs of her husband and his girlfriend when we go back and ask her for the list. The sods! The mysterious hooded Mr. X. Yeah, very neatly done, isn't it? It's like the tyres and my front door. A villain with O levels. Well, they do all levels in prison, you know. Rehabilitation. Reverend gentlemen. Now, the interesting about that is that, I mean, some of that dialogue could come out of the mouth of James Bowden. Yes. I mean, yeah. no, I mean what, were we, did you always intend to recast? Or uh, was it not available? No, what, what happened was that I was commissioned to write a sequel to Get Lost, which I was going to call Get Lost Revisited. And by that time, Alan had gone into Nicholas Nickleby with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I think might have been on Broadway at that point. And they said, well, if we can't have Alan Armstrong, what are we going to do? We'll have to pull the whole thing. And I said, let's ask Jimmy Bolam. 
because I'd worked with Jim in radio and kind of knew him socially. On the, it was that a great extended mafia yeah. in exile thing. <laughs> and so Jim read the scripts and I said, well, we'll give it a different title. Uh, so I, I rewrote it and it became The Beiderbeck Affair. And we decided that a new couple. Were, um, they, were they the first chance you got to put jazz in, into your work on telly? Um, I suppose Get Lost was probably the first time I did it consciously, because that was all the Duke Ellington score. I mean, the music, the main theme was a, a Duke Ellington piece called Dual Highway. And Frank Ricotti, who did the music, did all the, you know, the incidental music in the style of a, a small Ellington group. Mm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was watching that hearing Kenny Baker <laughs> uh, as Cootie Williams and Don Lusher as Lawrence Brown and being very boring. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I think it probably was. I'd use, I'd use music, obviously, in Trinity Tales. Yeah, sure. Where, uh, and, uh, and in Land of Green Ginger, where we used the Watersons, mm -hmm. the great mm -hmm. traditional uh, singing family from, from Hull as an integral. I mean, they actually mm. determined the story. Um, I mean, the... the, the well, there was a little pep here. I mean, you had Trinity Tales and also Curricula, Curricula. Oh, too, yeah. Right? Oh, I mean, having, having the music in there, that, that, they said that, that, was, that they were like musical dramas, really. I suppose. Yeah, the uh, there was a vogue for, for rock musicals at the time. I think everybody was doing a rock musical. And, and again, this is, I think, a very David Rose thing to do. He said he would, he put me in a room with Dave Greenslade and said, yeah, "Why don't you two work together?" And Dave Greenslade is a keyboard player, uh, the Quiet Man of Rock. Works with a band called Coliseum with John Heisman and Chris Farlow, and um, and we so we Julie sat down in a room together and and I listened to some of his music and and we came up with Curriculi, Curri which was originally. I mean, my original title was Spanners Across the Campus, because it's about a plumber who's left his spanners on the campus and goes to get them back again. And that was the plot. I mean, I mean never <laughs> heavy with plots. Uh, and then destroys the entire institution in innocence. Were you, were you pleased that the Bidebecker seal became as big as they were? Or did you yeah. think that that sort of restricted you later as to what kind of drama you could write? No, I think, I think if you... Twist my arm behind my back and say, "What's the most satisfactory, th satisfying thing you've done for the telly?" It's probably the the, you know, the Biderbeck trilogy. There's more more of it is nearer, mm. more of it is what I wanted on the screen yeah. than anything else. You came else back to do a radio story, didn't you? A few. Um, they did a, a short story, yes, um, about when they do Wagner's Ring Cycle as a school play. <laughs> uh, uh, a short encounter with Richard Wagner. <laughs> did people never try and make it, did it get you to make some more then? I did. Um, not after we did the third series, we had, we had a little meeting, and Jim and Barbara and myself, and we, say, we thought, quit while you're ahead, which is what all the best television programmes have always done. Yeah. Then about five years down the line, I got the notion of a, doing a Christmas special, a one-off special, and they were both up for it by then. And Yorkshire Television were up for it. The ITV Network Centre, uh, rather say, yeah, that's a good idea, do it. They they studied in some depth the viewing figures for every episode of the three series, and and I don't know what the else they did. Probably discussed it with their focus groups and the the bit of bit of seaweed hanging outside the window, and <laughs> studied various entrails, and and they said, and they turned us down. And I think we had one more token attempt two or three years later, and so and after that I think it becomes pointless. Yes. So yeah. you think, oh, the hell with it. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I, and I think there there comes a point where it could become embarrassing because the gap. I think the only show that really pulled it off was what whatever happened to the Likely Lads. I mean, I think that was a triumph. And I mean, Dick and Ian can do it. So they did it with Alfie the same as well. To be sure. fair, suddenly sure. thinking. Yeah, uh, but I, on the other hand, I, I thought the the attempt when David Nobbs tried to do Reggie Perry and bring back the mm -hmm. uh, the the was revenge of the, gap, was the, the, the gap was too big and was and big. all these actors look mm -hmm. really rather old mm -hmm. and and I know we all get old and uh, but suddenly jazz, jazz I suppose had arrived in your work which is good. Mm -hmm. We might have a clip from 
dogging around, possibly, Mark. Yeah, if you want to look at this, see if you can recognise who this gentleman is. Gentlemen, you've been a marvellous audience. Credit to Bulgaria. <laughs> What's with this Alfred Hitchcock lark then, eh? Yeah. Well, it wasn't my idea. Not, nothing's ever my idea. I wrote it. I mean, I did have this character who walks into the club and sits down. Uh, does, uh, But he is still there the next morning when uh, Geraldine James goes to the club having been offered this job of looking after a piano player. And the, the same character is lying on... But this is before Ronnie's was remodelled and improved. <laughs> and there was this sort of settee in the, in the entrance lobby. And so he's lying on the settee with his hat. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, somebody said, if, if he's not claimed in 48 hours, he's yours. I mean, that was the line, which also got <laughs> cut because it was over length. And, they, and uh, yeah, the producer and director, uh, Desmond Davis, the director, said, well, of course, you're doing this, aren't you? This is your Hitchcock shot. <laughs> and I said, I hadn't realised that. He said, well, no, and we, we have it on good authority that you have the hat. And indeed, they, they, I do have the, the hat. was given to us by, given to me by one of the kids, one of our, <laughs> the next generations. That's for when you go jazzing, she said. And there's this rather cool Brilliant. Lester Brilliant. Young hat. The, the, well, we actually shot the exteriors of, of me walking into the club in the middle of a heat wave in Soho on a Sunday night. Uh, and because it, uh, in the script it was raining, so I had the, the fire brigade spraying water on me, on Umbra, and people across the other side of the street from Ronnie Scott's looking at, watching this, thinking, who is this man that we've never heard of doing these absurd things? And it was the last shot of the series, so afterwards we're all going off to, to the party. Elliot Gould, who played the lead, was sitting opposite in shorts, so shirt, big beard, sitting in a doorway uh, where Shirley saw him and she said to him, Elliot, if you sit like, sit there like that, people are going to give you money. <laughs> Shirley, they already have. <laughs> so it'd be, it'd look, it's just like a Soho down and out. And, uh, Brilliant. So that was... So, 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 I mean, I, mean, I think we could probably, I suspect you've got a story for every play you've ever written, probably, haven't you? It Ten. sounds like, yeah, Ten. it sounds like, you know, you need to write another book of memoirs, I think, probably. To well, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I, yes, I probably could. I, I get very garrulous and sometimes have to be taken outside and <laughs> hosed, well, well, I won't take hosed outside down. Because I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know, I mean, obviously, I said earlier, your sort of career has a, a sort of different compartments almost. Mm, I mean, yeah. I mean, let's think about this this work of adapting other people's work for a moment. I yeah. mean, you, you know, I'm mean, the Barchester Chronicles you mentioned already. Fortunes of War. We had Jimmy Keflin Jones here some years mm -hmm. ago talking about about that. Uh, and uh, you you did, you did Sherlock Holmes, yeah. uh, which we're showing today, etc. I mean, is that a whole new challenge as a writer? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very simple. I, I, I read the book, and if there's a, a hat where I can a peg where I can hang my hat, that's fine. So, uh, and I'll. It, as far as the, the kind of cop show genre is concerned, I like to have a whack at everybody. So I've had a whack at practically all of them, apart from Colin Dexter, actually. Mm. Um, I, I was offered Morse, but at a time when I was too busy. And, uh, but uh, uh, Ruth Rendell, uh, Marjorie Allingham. Yes. I mean, do, I won't go Let's into have that. a little look at Sherlock. Sherlock Holmes, Mark? She's the solitary cyclist, mm. one we're not showing today. But one that strikes me about the work I've seen in your so far is flashbacks feature quite heavily in what you do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's have a little look, Mark. On the following Monday, Holmes found that he had business which detained him in London. So he dispatched me on the early train to Farnham that I might observe Miss Smith's passage past Charlington Hall. The setting was just as she had described, heavily wooded on the side bordering the hall and utterly exposed on the other. I selected the only available cover and waited. Um. 
um, the Sherlock Holmes is a quite tricky because when you point a camera at the things that are being described, you realise how nonsensical they are frequently. Uh, I mean, I, I, that one has gone from. I mean, I, I don't remember too much. The other one, um, Man with the Twisted Lip, yeah. is interesting because if you dramatise it straight off the page, what you actually, what is it there on the page, it would run for about 20 minutes mm -hmm. and it'd be most of the two of them sitting in a carriage driving out to Kent. Yeah. So it was, you really do have to dramatise it because it's not dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so that was fair. fair and, uh, the, the, they both shared. <laughs> Excuse me. They both share disguise. Yeah, them, he was heavily. He, he was really into all that disguising stuff, which uh, is easier done on the page than on the screen, uh, mm. because um, and, I, and I think we didn't quite pull it off in. in no, the I think it's interesting. I mean, I, mean, I suppose it's it's, it's, a, it's a famous story in the sense that people remember it, and, and it's got that dramatic sort of shooting at the end, etc. Mm -hmm. But I thought your dialogue was more evident in the Twisted Lip episode, actually, because there, there uh, were some touches there I could almost see the Alan Plater of the plays yes, coming through. I'm in that afraid, scene. yes, I think guilty as charged, but I think that was necessary. Um, I mean, I topped and tailed it with this thing where he's doing an experiment with with, yes, with, yes. with, a, with a test tube and things, and which had nothing, it isn't in the story, but was, I mean, it, it filled five minutes of screen time and it made a nice picture frame. And, and, it's, and it's what the Americans have always done. You know, you get the re the resolution of the story, and then a little comic yes. tail piece, and uh, which can get tiresome when it's formulaic, and it does get tiresome uh, uh, frequently. I find. I, I mean, I spotted this 30, 40, 50 years ago with Raymond Burr's first series, uh, which predated Ironside, when they always solved the crime, and then the three of them always had a little joke at the end. And I would sit there thinking, no, oh, here comes the joke. And uh, <laughs> so I'll go put the kettle on now. And, uh, and I think the audience, I mean, our audiences are much more sophisticated than we give them credit for. I mean, not than I give them credit, but than they give them credit for. And they spot things. They spot things. And we insult them by throwing the same old cliche structures mm. at them, which is. You, you must write very quickly. Yeah. You're very prolific. Well, uh, yeah, I remember when in the Z-Cars days, John Hopkins was the most productive writer on the team, also the script editor. And I said to him, how do you do it? He said, oh, right, when do you write your scripts? At a weekend. And he would go home Friday night and he'd come in Monday morning with a, a Z-Cars episode, with a complete episode. And I thought, oh, well, it, I'll see if I can do it in two days. Yeah. <laughs> and so I did write one in two days just to prove that I could have like machismo yeah. Yeah. Uh, because what it ended up it, it destroyed John's health and uh, I, I thought I'm not going to let it destroy mine but I, yeah I, and I think I like to write at the speed it plays because I don't make oh god I don't did make did you it, slow him down shortly did you make him take breaks to stop him from overworking <laughs> I, I don't overwork anymore <laughs> But I, oh, I, I like to write it at the speed it because I don't make it up, I hear it. And I'm, I'm hearing these characters and I just copy down what they say. And I don't stop thinking, oh, it would be better if they said it. I mean, they've said it by now and then I might go back I've, and... I've never wondered if I, can, if I can write creatively in that way. I mean, I've written plenty of factual writing, mm -hmm. whether it's about television or about uh, teaching. So I write, I write articles on teaching and books on teaching nowadays. But I, I guess I, 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 I'm, the characters to me have never quite sounded in that way that you do. Mm -hmm. I mean when you start writing do you actually know where you're going at the end or is no. it completely open I've got a sort of head arrangement it, I mean it is like jazz I know that I've got to fill 12 bars or 32 bars and kind of what key it's in and and I know there needs to be a quiet bit and a mm -hmm. loud bit and a dramatic bit and a poignant bit and a big finish and a dying fall and <coughs> my my late agent Peggy Ramsey used to, uh, <coughs> talking about dramatic structure, she used to say, oh, it's perfectly simple, darling, lots of little surprises and every so often a big one, <laughs> uh, which is pretty good. And uh, it, it, you can analyse most drama and it'll, <laughs> it'll, if it's any good, it'll, it'll offer that analysis. I get very impatient with the American script doctors and people who teach you how to do it, the McKees of the world, because I think they're wrong, actually. 
That's interesting. Before I, before I, 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 I assume a few more questions I've got for you, let's ask the audience. Uh, any questions from the audience at the moment? Before I go into sitcoms and things like that. Go on. When you were adapting uh, Barton's Chronicles, how did you cope with the fact that this was Trollope's rather archaic dialogue and make sure that the people watching it, when you come to music, would get what it was all about? Um, I, I, I was pretty true to his dialogue most of the time. Um, what I, I mean, I, there were one or two discoveries I made that, for example, what we miss, uh, if you just underline the dialogue and put he said, he said, she said, put the characters' names behind these, what you miss is his running commentary, his editorial comments on what's going on. And it seemed to me that his attitudes, I troll up the author's attitudes, most closely match those of, of Archdeacon Grantley, the, the Nigel Hawthorne part. So Nigel got a lot of Trollope's lines, best lines, sort of honed <laughs> and refined and fitted in. I uh, also had to make up quite a bit because I mean, the, 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 the most obvious thing being the Obadiah Slope sermon in the cathedral that sets the place on fire, that creates a schism in the town. And it's, Trollope doesn't write the sermon. It doesn't oh. exist in the text. So I wrote the sermon. I also had to write it in such a way that it seemed to be lasting for at least an hour, as a Victorian sermon would, but in screen time it had to be kind of five minutes. And then the immediate verbal reactions from the, the main protagonists. And there was a particular speech that I think Donald Pleasance had following the Slope sermon. I had a letter, for, a letter from someone saying they'd searched the book over and over again trying to find this speech and they couldn't find it. The reason is it's not there. Uh, so, but I enjoyed making up, I enjoyed inventing dialogue in that Victorian kind of manner. I mean, we, we used to joke at the time that when I was working on it, it, Shirley would say, would you like a cup of tea? And I would say things like, well, I will accept it with gratitude should it be offered, but <laughs> I, will, I will put up with the want of it should it be withheld. <laughs> and she would say, no, do you want a cup of tea? <laughs> And, and it is rather, it's, it's, it's nice to write in that rather formal way because I think we all, as, as dramatists, we want, we want to do, do our Oscar Wilde stuff as well as the, you know, I can do the A Up stuff, you know, and the Why You Bugger stuff. That's fairly straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Any other questions? Um, the BBC under David Rose, which is really a BBC pebble mill, the pebble mill period, from my selfish point of view, because he more or less let me do as I like, uh, and Yorkshire Television in the sort of Peter Wills, David Cunliffe period, where the same thing applied. And um, but I mean, on the whole, I've I've had a, I mean, I've been allowed to work in television for f forty something years. And that's pretty unusual for a writer. Mm. I mean, there, there are one or two old lags. I mean, Andrew Davis is my age, more or less, and and I guess, oh, I don't know, Richard Harris is still chugging away doing The Last Detective, and um, Gordon Newman, who's kind of my, I mean, my generation. So they're, they're still encouragers. <laughs> Do you, you ever see yourself doing film? I've, I've done movies, and... I like the me I like the medium and I hate the industry. Um, I mean, I've, I think I've done four and a half. I've got four and a half big screen credits, <laughs> and the the last one I was f characteristically fired from without anyone telling me. I mean, there, <laughs> there was a producer called Stanley Jaffe who was very, very famous, very rich. And want, decided he wanted to do a remake of The Four Feathers, uh, uh, which a very odd thing to want to do and he asked me if I'd like to do it in a big epic movie I thought well I'll give it a go and uh, so I did all the moody and you know the, the first class flights to LA and New York and the best hotels and limos and I mean, I don't know, something, but yeah, something, all the bollocks if you like Yeah. 
And I did three drafts, and then it all went a bit quiet. And I thought, oh, they, they'll have replaced me, and indeed they had, and <laughs> somebody else. And I think then Stanley was replaced. I mean, eventually the whole thing happened with different producers, I mean, to wholly different. And the movie disappeared without trace, but a very expensive catastrophe. From all, from, from, I couldn't really see the point in doing it, but I, I gave it my best shot because I thought it would be an interesting experience. Yes. to yeah. Because yeah. I'd done other movies, but not that, I hadn't done that full kind of Hollywood thing. Mm. And it was it was kind of funny and silly and... <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any challenges you feel you haven't done yet? Uh, yeah, the, the next thing is always going to be... I mean, I'm doing... I mean, but the safety valve through all this, I mean, because I think there's been a lot of twaddle in television. I mean, a lot of twaddle on screen, a lot of even more twaddle backstage. And you have to live with some of that. Now, my safety valve has been theatre. I mean, I've done, I think, 39 and a half stage plays. Um, you like the half, don't you? The half. Well, it's because I've not quite finished it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, and the, 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 the half, it's, it's sort of three quarters now, isn't it? It's a jazz musical, which will be on autumn of next year. Co-production between Live Theatre Newcastle, Octagon Theatre Bolton and Hampstead Theatre. And it's called Waiting for Buddy. And they, actually the central character is a, a discontented, unhappy architect. <laughs> working in a tall tower a on a... circle there. Working in a tall tower on a high hill in Newcastle, overlooking <laughs> gates, uh, overlooking the quayside, who in his head is Philip Marlowe. And the MacGuffin is the lost recording of Buddy Bolden, which will not mean anything probably to anyone who's not a jazz fan. Uh, Buddy Bolden <laughs> was the first great New Orleans jazz musician who was sent to an asylum in, I think, 1911 and lived there the rest of his life and died in 31, never having recorded. But it was said mm -hmm. his playing was so loud you could hear it all across the Mississippi Delta. So consequently, jazz fans the world over have always been obsessed by the lost recording. Somewhere oh, there see. must be a recording, a cylinder or just a single <laughs> acetate of Buddy Bolden. So that becomes, that's the holy grail. That's, that's the, the Da Vinci it's code. very clever. Very uh, clever so it? it's about the lost recording, of, but that's the MacGuffin. And it all happens in Newcastle. And, uh, and Alan Barnes, my, my partner in musical crimes, is doing the music and so that's the, the that's and that'll be exciting that'll be exciting because I don't know whether it's going to work any, any more questions go, go on Peter yeah. I, I inferred from what you said earlier that you have some misgivings about the current state of TV drama um, if so where did it all go wrong how can they put right and do you have any confidence that it will be put right um, I think it all went I think it's been a, a slow erosion of things. I mean, there, there was a, a key moment in when the BBC closed down its script unit, which is where writers could send their work, and it would be read. This was part of the public service obligation. I think it went wrong when they closed, when they discontinued the the the, the post head of plays, uh, and I think it, it's. It's been the gradual uh, <coughs> swamping of the landscape by soap opera and by, they say, oh, let's do Casualty, which started as a pioneering series run by a pioneering producer called Geraint Morris to say, look, this is what's happening in the health service and it's wrong and something should be, you know, and, and it had a kind of missionary zeal about it. Every series has a natural lifespan, I think, and all these things have outlived their natural lifespan. So, so then we have to have Holby City, and now we have Holby Blue. I know. You know and soon we'll have Holby News, Holby Weather Forecast. We're going to have Holby Dustbin Men, we are. I said, yes, I said this yeah. with our last guest, Mike Vardy. I said, Holby Dustbin Men is the new series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Adrian and I have always said we should do Nan, the Asian <laughs> granny detective, you see, because, yeah. Yeah. because no one's done that angle yet, you know. You've got to have an angle to be cookie, haven't you, you know? There was a period in the, in the 70s when they figured you could get, you could sell any series if it was about a job, somebody doing a job. They are, yeah. Adrian, we missed our baby yeah. series. And um, I said it... At this plan, I was going to make a submission for a series called The Water Diviners, 
and I wrote a couple of pages about a series about water diviners. <laughs> and I was going to submit, I thought, no, they'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just going to do it as a, sort, as a joke. And, and I actually wrote a couple of pages. It read so convincingly, I thought, some bugger's going to buy this. I, I worked for the prison service for a while, in a female prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came out of that job, going back into teaching, saying, I'm going to write a, a drama series set in a female prison. Mm -hmm. And of course, bad girls turned up about a year later, yep. which completely ruined me. And was nowhere near as real to life as, as I would have been. So, so I thought, well, exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, mean, there's no shortage of... Scum meats. I think what, what... Bambi, probably, or something. I think, I think it's a fundamental betrayal by the BBC of this because commercial television has been utterly 100% commercial since Margaret Thatcher sold off the franchises and made it a bidding war. At that point, you more said to ITV, forget about public service, you're there to make money. That is all you have to believe in. And in a weird way, I would rather work for ITV than the BBC now because as long as I mean, I'm working for Lewis, which is, which is based mostly on my friendship with Kevin Waitley, as a matter of fact, and the relationship with Kevin. Uh, oh, that's where it began. As long as we deliver 8 million people or so, we, we will stay on the air. And that's a very simple... I can understand that. Uh, the BBC does not have to play the market game. And if they're playing the market game, then they've denied the reason for their own existence. And I think they're very confused and very frightened, and I don't see, and I don't know why they have to pay people millions of pounds a year to work for them. Mm. I mean, that is a scandal, I think. And I'm not. I mean, Jonathan Ross is I'm, uh, he's a perfectly amiable chap. I've no doubt. I mean, I met him. He seemed very nice. He is not worth. Nobody is worth that. Amount. No single broadcaster. And they're paying for for no one sounds amazing. People like Jonathan Ross and Graham Norton who can't actually do anything. Who are essentially their 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 shtick is parasitical, you know. Unless there's somebody for Jonathan to interview or a film for him to present, you know, stand there entertainers on your own for 45 minutes. You can't have, for, and for this for this he's paid millions of pounds, and it seems a total nonsense. They pay me nothing for City. It's a scandal. Exactly. Like exactly. Yeah. Please note, yeah. Simon. But but uh, never mind. Never mind. So yeah, and uh, and I think there is a lack of will to confront. Mm. And they, and they say, oh, oh, you're bleating on about the golden age. Said, there are certain, it's not that all the programs we've made were good. Uh, when I looked at the list of stuff that you're showing today, the one or two that I'm, I might easily be wincing at if I, when, when I get to <laughs> see them. Uh, and in a way, you should. It's like looking at old photograph albums. Yep. My God, mm -hmm. did we ever wear clothes like that? Uh, wide, wide ties and 22-inch mm -hmm. you know, trouser bottoms and... and um, very so, there's two things I have to very quickly ask you about because I'm mm. very good time. One is Oliver's Travels, yeah. which has two different endings, Simon tells me. One from this country, I think, and one from the overseas. Very, very subtly different. And, and I was just intrigued by this. Yeah. <laughs> I can explain this. Go on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is an open secret that this, this whole series was, from my point of view, a bit of a catastrophe. Uh, I wrote it for Tom Courtney uh, and ended up agreeing to do it with Alan Bates uh, for a whole set of reasons we won't go into. Uh, it caused a, a breach, a major breach in my oldest friendship in the world, which is with Tom, we went to school together, which is now fixed. It took a year at least to fix that. Uh, I mean, Alan Bates was a fine actor, I believe the wrong fine actor for this. And I also argued with the director, uh, Giles Foster. Uh, we disagreed about practically everything. I think he was the wrong director for the show. And I discovered to my horror when I saw the final cut version, or the, not, not the final cut, that it got all these people marching up the hill in Orkney, having some Celtic ceremony of a kind that never happens in Orkney <laughs> anyway. 
but we actually know quite a few of the people who got got work for they got paid you know an extra rate extras <laughs> rate to march a bill carrying a flaming torch with a choreographer shouting flambeaux's up <laughs> flambeaux's down and the work and orkney is is uh, there's a little society of people who were who got to say flam uh, got to carry flambeaux's in and i looked at this i said that's absolute crap it's got to go and it was before digital um, uh, ch uh, editing and everything so was but there was, there was a, uh, a thing called paint box and and apparently the guy in shepherd's bush who, who could remove this and they took out these mummers let's call them mummers from the, the the UK version, although you could actually you can see where they've been if you look very carefully. Because there's a funny edge on the hillside. <laughs> As it's just, the last scene is about Alan Bates and Sinead Cusack and Billy Patterson standing at the ring of Brodgar, explaining the plot, the yeah you know, the remains of the plot and resolve. You don't need all that crap on it. I mean, it's <laughs> awful. I so I hit the roof, not for the first time. <laughs> uh, uh, the other show, I, I, I'm very quick because I went towards the end, that I've heard you, well, I've heard you say nice things about it, but also I've heard people say that perhaps you weren't as happy with it. Was, oh, no, it's Selwyn Froggy. Yeah, so um, had mixed feelings I had it. mixed feelings about Selwyn. Selwyn began, again, it was the fault of Pebble Mill. We were doing, we were doing Trinity Tales in the bar, talking to Bill Maynard. I said, hey, kid, hey, kid, have you, done a, have you ever done a sitcom? I said, no, Bill, I haven't. Ah, oh, he said, because, and he'd done a pilot. Oh, oh no, it's Selwyn yeah. Froggett with Yorkshire, written by Roy Clark, Roy Clark yeah. of uh, Last of the Summer Wine fame. And Roy wasn't available to do the series. So I said, well, Roy can't do it, will you do it, will you do it? So I said, yeah, all right then. It was, it was kind of like that. And I went through to Leeds and I saw Duncan Wood, who was the head of Light Entertainment. And, and he said, are you up for it? I said, yeah, all right then. So fine. And I kind of assumed in my innocence that Bill would learn the lines I'd written. <laughs> and the, the, the other wonderful actor, you know, Billy Dean and Ray Moore, Harold Goodwin, learned their <laughs> lines, and we'd do it. And Bill was like, well, no, no, don't let's do it. Like, you know, I'll, I'll do that, I'll do that. You know, I'll spill my beer, you do that, and then I'll drop the eggs. <laughs> oh, all right. And, and Harold Goodwin used to swore that I sat in the gallery when we were recording Selwyn, and if I heard a line that I'd, I'd written, I would shout, bingo. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so it, it was. I see. I thought Bill had the potential to be the next Tony Hancock, to be as as significant mm. a figure as, as Tony Hancock. Because, uh, but uh, he had a comedian's mentality. I think that said, "I've got to get all the laughs. I'm, I'm yeah. the star comedian. Yeah. I've got to." Which in fact Hancock yeah. didn't. I mean, which I know from uh, other sources. Because, because ha Hancock. That was his day's downfall. It was when he decided to become to like the total centre of the show yeah. and lose the, the, the sort of other character, the Sid James yeah. character, that worked against him. Because Absolutely. it's like all yeah. great comedians really need a foil in, in some way to feed off and, and to feed back to. You know? Absolutely. And, and double yeah. acts work far better as chemistry than, than singles. Yeah. I think yeah. Way, particularly with the camera. Uh, so it wasn't as much fun as I'd hoped. I mean, by the second series, we'd be. We'd, we developed a, a way of working together with, with Ronnie Baxter, the, who produced and directed, and the team, and the, 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 the lads in the club. We, we, so there was a kind of camaraderie. So I actually did two... Uh, the second series got to number one in the ratings. So it's the only time I've been number one in the ratings. <laughs> and it was weird. I got a phone call from the Daily Mail in London saying, what does it feel like to be number one? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, Selwyn's number one. I said, oh... I suppose it's that's nice, and so, and we went. It's not magic, am I? That yeah, on the back of Trinity Tales, because we, we Bill and I used to get VIP tickets to the Rugby League Cup final, <laughs> and we went to the Rugby League Cup final that year. And as we went into the it was a VIP box behind the Royal Box, we went in, and the entire crowd round about was standing up and chanting magic, like doing this, <laughs> which wasn't even the, the most famous line I wrote, which I didn't write. Nor did Bill. It was the, the the man on whom it is based, a man called Peter, who drank at the same working men's club in Leicester as Bill. It's all based based on this guy Peter, <laughs> who, uh, I, who I met uh, after the you know, we'd done a couple of episodes, and I went through to Bill's place and 
So come on, go down. I'll, I'll introduce you to Peter. And there was Peter, and it was just like him. He said, but you got something wrong. You got it wrong, you know. I said, what, what did we get wrong? He said, I'm left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a big, innocent child. And, and, uh, Brilliant. That's great. That's great. It's a great way to finish off, really. What we're going to do, we're going to have some tea and cake now. Lovely. We're doing some tea and cake, because we, we're very civilised at these dudes we are. And we will run these clips while there's travels at about 3.55, just, just before the next programme. Thank you so much, yeah. Alan. Can I say one thing? Us. We're, we're going to yeah, not sure. stay until 7 o'clock this evening, because we've at, at the late stage, where we've got three grandchildren doing a sleepover at our house tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a... Uh, and it's just a, the rain starting about 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, uh, we, well, no, the, they're, they're wonderful, <laughs> but... Um, we, so we, we are going to watch My Choice, which is episode one of my trilogy. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. And then we're going to slip That's quietly great. away. But so, it's so nothing now's personal. Now's a good time to get, you interview, to, get your interviews, to get your autographs done and come and talk, talk to Alan during the interval. And thank you so much, Alan. Fascinating. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you.